Well, thank you all for joining us today. And it's with great pleasure that I get to introduce tonight's speaker. I got to spend the afternoon with her and her husband, so um, you are in for a treat. Let me introduce her. Author Patricia Cutright is Lakota and an enrolled member of the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe. Patricia has lived in many places, from Brooklyn, New York, to the Federated States of Micronesia, Micronesia, <laughs> and many places in between providing leadership in libraries along the way. She has published articles and written book chapters on library technology and cooperation. Her awards include the 2003 American Library Association LITA Gaylord Award for Achievement in Library and Information Technology, 2002 Oregon Librarian of the Year, 2017 University of Washington School Distinguish, Distinguished Alumnus Award, and 2016 Presidential Administrator Award from Central Washington University. Patricia served as Dean of the CWU Libraries from 2010 to 2017. I'm not sure when she had time to write this book. <laughs> During her tenure, she was responsible for several initiatives that served to heighten library awareness and appreciation. Reading in libraries have always been her passion, recognizing how reading can empower all ages and socioeconomic levels. She is retired from library work, but is busier than ever with travel, volunteering, and keeping the garden growing. Native Women Changing Their Worlds is her first book. Please welcome Patricia Cutright. I can't tell you how thrilled I am to be here. I truly appreciate the invitation to come in. I thank Deb for, for her tenacity and <laughs> contacting me and following up. And, it's, it's just been a joy, and this beautiful facility, thank you. It's, it really feels like <clears throat> it's the right space to be, to be making these, doing these readings for you. So thank you so much for your generosity and, and the, the nice his hospitality. I'm going to read two entries for you today, excerpts actually. Um, uh, for you. Often, when I do these readings, um, one of the questions that uh, in, invariably pops up is, how did this happen? How did you get, uh, what, what inspired you to, to do this book? And I always don't have to think very long on it, because I came from a line of women, incredible, strong Native women. Uh, these women uh, were uh, my aunties. My mother was one of nine girls. She was raised in a, on the, the prairies of South Dakota, outside of Eagle Butte, South Dakota, Cherry Creek, if any of you know where that's at, um, in something that you and I would probably think of more as a yurt. Uh, it was a one-room house, uh, had sod roof on it, uh, canvas walls, a wooden floor. Nine girls, one boy, and mother and father all lived in, in that. Um, and if you can imagine, you know what it's like in the winters in South Dakota, often dipping below zero. And these women, they... They survived, they not only survived, they thrived. And all nine of them were products of the boarding school uh, situation. And so we, we heard a lot of, of different stories. Um, they, uh, they had uh, 
some, some really interesting times. Uh, us kids grew up listening to their coming of age stories of government boarding school trauma and difficult living conditions. But also, there were the good times. <clears throat> like Saturday night dances when Lawrence Welk would come to town and they would, they'd get their older, their brother, the one boy <laughs> would get their brother to, to load them all into the Model T pickup that they had and haul them into town so that they could dance all night to Lawrence Welk. The stoic toughness and the resilience instilled great respect and admiration in me. So when I was approached in 2019 by a, by a publisher who was wondering if I'd be interested in writing something like this, I thought, yeah, I can do this because I was brought up by such strong Native women. So what I'm going to do is read excerpts from two chapters out of, out of this book. Uh, and the chapters that I'm reading are, hopefully you've, you recognize a couple of the names, Henrietta Mann and Dr. Henrietta Mann and Eloise Cabell. Both, both of them are Montanans and uh, are Montana uh, here, uh, come up and, and are well known. And so I thought that that would be a good, good fit for us. Henrietta Mann, <clears throat> even in the worst situations, find the good there because we also believe that we are here only one time. I don't have a second chance to come back and correct anything that I might have done wrong. This is Henrietta Mann speaking. As the spring winds blew across the green prairie grass, the cry of a newborn filled the air. She was the child of Henry and Lenora Wolfgang Mann. Her entry into this world was long awaited and much anticipated by all, especially her great-grandmother, white buffalo woman. To introduce her to the world that lay ahead, white buffalo woman held the child in prayer as she would a sacred pipe, offering her to the four sacred directions, and then to the earth, and then to the sky. She named her Standing Twenty Women, meaning she would have the abilities and the knowledge of 20 women. She later told the child's father as she lay on her deathbed that Henrietta was the child she had been waiting for. The old Cheyenne woman knew this child would do great things. Henrietta Mann was born, she was blessed, and on her way to a long life and successful future her great-grandmother had prayed for. Henrietta, or Henry as she would be called, was part of a large loving family that had four generations in one household, all living together in a three-room house. She can remember the layout of the house in her great-grandmother's bed, tucked away in the kitchen, which is usually the warmest room in the house. The Mann family lived traditional communal arrangements near Hammond, Oklahoma on land allotted to their grandfather in the 1880s. They raised cattle and lived off the land until the 1950s when the Cheyenne people were forced to move into towns or to government lands nearby. Living in a multi-generational household meant there was never a loss of love for young Henrietta. When she and her father would drive up to the house, she would jump out of the car before the car even came to a full stop, and she'd run into the arms of her great-grandmother. One of her fondest memories growing up is crawling into her great-grandmother's lap 
for an embrace from that strong woman who had suffered so much in her life. Henry's great-grandmother's white buffalo woman and Vester survived the 1864 and the 1868 slaughter of the Cheyenne people at Sand Creek and Washite, where 700 American troops led by Colonel John Shevington attacked the peaceful villages of Chief Black Kettle. Nearly 300 Cheyenne people were killed or taken captive for slaves. <clears throat> the battle cry from Colonel Shevington as his troops descended on the camp at dawn while the villagers slept was, damn any man who sympathizes with Indians, kill and scalp them all, big and little, because nits make lice. Such tragic memories are the history of Native people. They can make a person resentful and angry, but they can also make a person stronger and more determined. The latter was the case with Henry Mann. Her family valued their history, their language, and culture, and Henry credits her grandfather for this. He was her first and dearest friend and the one who made sure she was raised with the knowledge of the Cheyenne culture and language. Once Henry started school, her grandfather would have an auntie come to the house every afternoon to teach her Cheyenne language so that she did not lose that. As Henry progressed through school, she often experienced blatant discrimination that caused hurt and sometimes anger. When her teachers would ask the students to name colors or count one to a hundred, little hands would shoot up, native and non-native alike. But never would the native children be called upon. The most hurtful, though, was when the native children were routinely segregated from the rest of the class to be checked for lice. These practices carried out by the teachers and other adults caused the white children to call the native students names such as lousy Indians or dirty Indians. The pain and the humiliation were too much at times for young Henry, and she voiced her upset to her grandfather. He shared his wisdom with her, and he explained, they look at us different, Henry, and you'll have to deal with what that Indian-Anglo relations are all about. Your great-grandmother prayed for you to lead a good life. Always remain Cheyenne and try to make them bitter people. Henrietta Mann says, and that is why I became a teacher. Henrietta enjoyed school, and she advanced very quickly. After graduating at the age of 17, she received a scholarship to attend Southwestern Oklahoma University. She graduated in 1954 with a bachelor's degree in English and a minor in business education. She was the first Cheyenne woman to ever receive a college degree. Henry was living up to her name of Standing 20 Woman. She had shown her knowledge and her determination to succeed. At this time, her family honored her with a new name, Prayer Woman, after her paternal grandmother, Lucy White Bear Mann. Over the next 16 years, Henrietta and her husband, L. Whiteman, along with their four children, experienced a series of changes and challenges. The years were filled with the usual responsibilities of raising a family and Henry working on an advanced degree. She completed her master's at Oklahoma State University and was immediately hired at the University of California in Berkeley where she taught courses in Native American studies. 
What an exciting time it was for them in Berkeley. The United States was experiencing terrible social upheaval at that time, and protests and demonstrations were a constant occurrence. The African American Black Panthers group and the Native American organizations, such as the American Indian Movement, were voicing their frustrations over social injustice. Although Henrietta was teaching Native American studies, her classes were often a sea of white faces. Why was that? The Native students were gone as they had joined the protests occupying Alcatraz that abandoned federal, that abandoned federal prison located in the San Francisco Bay. But this did not daunt Henry's enthusiasm for teaching. She says, I felt inspired to share our wonderful native ways with the students, the majority of whom were non-native. I said to myself, this is where I belong. And that is where she stayed for the next two years. But with a growing family and often unrest on every corner, Henrietta and Al finally decided this was not a healthy environment in which to raise their children. They made the decision to move to Missoula, Montana, where Henry had been offered a di the directorship and faculty position at the University of Montana. Teaching at the university level is demanding, and although it's always rewarding, it is never without challenges. Soon Henry realized that if she wanted to excel in higher education, she'd have to get her doctorate degree. It was time for another move. The University of New Mexico was her next stop, and in 1982, she completed her doctoral degree. This happened at a time when very few Native Americans even had a college degree, much less a doctorate. She continued her teaching at the University of Montana, but other opportunities lay ahead. After nearly 28 years at the University of Montana, Henry was ready for a change. When people are part of an organization for so long, they sometimes become like the chairs at a table. You're just expected to be there, to always be there but Henrietta's self-described personality as a boat rocker created opportunity, and she forged ahead. She uprooted and moved to Montana State University, where she became the first CATS endowed chair in the Native American Studies Department. Henrietta's time at Montana State University has been a kaleidoscope of activities. From teaching to assistant to the president to becoming an internationally renowned speaker on education, Native American culture, and the environment. No matter what challenges Henry takes on, be assured that it will be focused on her passion, the education for the improvement of the Native American people. Henrietta Mann was born of humble beginnings, blessed by her great-grandmother, and has lived in the Cheyenne Way. The years have made Henrietta's life a scrapbook of happiness and joy, full of loves and of losses. On the day she was accepted into her doctoral program, her husband lost his fight with liver disease and passed away. Years later, her son, and then her brother died of alcohol abuse. Life can challenge the heart and spirit, but Henrietta reaches back to the words of her ancestors and says, those kinds of losses, they're tragic. They can make you a very bitter, jaded person. I hope I'm not that way. There is beauty in tragedy. Life is what we make it. This powerful Cheyenne woman has been a teacher, a mentor, a role model, and a spiritual guide. 
Henry credits her family for the value they put on education and the culture of the Cheyenne people. She is a strong advocate for the environment and proud to represent Native people in their belief that all have a responsibility to love and protect our mother, the earth. Henry's work as a teacher has taken place in classrooms and conference halls. She says, our time on earth is very short. We should be about love and respect. Not one of us has a corner on sacredness. We should recognize each other as children of Mother Earth and Father Sky, recognizing kinship, recognize different cultures and different ways of looking at life. These words have changed the lives Henrietta Mann has touched and will continue to change lives long into the future. Thank you. My next reading, or the last reading, I should say. Yeah. Oh my God, how long? <laughs> my last reading <clears throat> is about Eloise Pepion Cabell. Anytime you have movement that seeks fundamental change for long standing injustice, there always has to be an iconic figure who leads the charge. The person who refuses to go to the back of the bus. That person is Eloise. This was Keith Harper. He was a lead attorney on the Cabell case. Eloise Pepion Cabell, she was larger than life. She was a force of nature who saw an injustice and set forth to correct the inequity. She took on the United States government and won, big time. She sued for the mismanagement of 500,000 individual Native American accounts handled by the U.S. Bureau of Indian Affairs. Eloise dedicated 15 years of her life to resolve the lawsuit, which resulted in a $3.4 million settlement for the Native people. This remarkable woman came from the humblest of beginnings. Eloise was born on the Blackfeet Indian Reservation on November 5th, 1945 to Polite Lawrence Pepion and Catherine Dubray. Eloise was the great granddaughter of the revered black leader, Mountain Chief, who led his people first on the battlefield and then in the negotiations in Washington, D.C. in the 1850s. Eloise's parents raised her to be a strong woman, and like Mountain Chief, her de determination also took her to Washington, D.C. to fight for her people. Eloise was the seventh of nine children in the Pepion family. They grew up on the prairies of Montana in a home that had no running water or electricity. Their father raised cattle and grew hay to feed the cows, while their children were all expected to work on the ranch. While Eloise was asked, when Eloise was asked where she got the stamina to keep moving forward despite the setbacks she often experienced later in life, she would share what her mother told her. I didn't raise any weak women. I only raised strong women. And so we remembered not to run away and say, poor me, poor me. We were standing up and we were being strong. Growing up on an Indian reservation in the 1950s, meant that often local schooling was not available. Eloise's older sisters and brothers were sent away to attend Indian boarding schools. 
When Eloise was four years old, her father managed to get a one-room schoolhouse built so that children in the area would not have to go away to boarding schools. She recalled visiting the new school with her father, sitting down at one of those desks and refusing to leave until he allowed her to attend. Throughout her years of education, Eloise was a good student, and in particular, she was skilled at working with numbers. While attending university, she interned as a clerk at the Blackfeet Bureau of Indian Affairs offices. Her job as an intern helped pay for college, but more importantly, it was there she firsthand saw the negligence and the injustice shown towards Native people at times, something she often heard about when she was growing up. As a child, Eloise would listen to her parents and their friends complain about the Bureau of Indian Affairs and its management of their property. Young Eloise would stand in her backyard and she would watch the men who were doing business on their father's land. There were riggers pumping oil, there were cattlemen grazing herds, and timber being harvested. But whatever money they were obviously making was not coming down to the Cabell family. Eloise recalled her father saying, why am I not getting any of this? It's my land. While working that first job with the BIA, Eloise realized the answer to her father's question. She remembered with much frustration how people would come to the BIA office and to pick up the checks they were owed. They would wait, sitting on hard wooden benches, sometimes all day or longer, while the agent sat behind a teller's window ignoring them. These stories that Eloise heard from family and friends made her question, why? These questions that spurred Eloise to demand accountability from the government. After living in Seattle for a few years where she married and had her son Turk, Eloise and her husband moved back to Montana to help run their father's ranch. They were busy raising a new son and they were working hard. As in many small communities though, the Cabell's return to the reservation did not go unnoticed. And in 1976, the Blackfeet tribal officials asked Eloise to become the treasurer for the tribe. Accepting the position meant that Eloise would be responsible for the accounts of thousands of tribal members who leased their property to outside companies. As Eloise became more familiar with the duties of her job, she realized that the span of years between her internship and now did not see any improvement in the BIA practices. Again, she found herself at odds with the BIA on their accounting procedures and questioned why tribal members' accounts were often not credited the income that they were due. BIA officials told her she should learn to read a financial statement. Humiliated but undeterred, she kept tracking discrepancies and asking for explanations. For 20 years, Eloise worked for the betterment of the Blackfeet people, with much of that time devoted to fighting the Bureau of Indian Affairs over errors and inconsistencies that included loans to other tribes that were never repaid, Indian trust funds used for the New York City's 1975 fiscal bailout, and the 1979 Chrysler Company's bailout. After years of trying to work with the BIA, she decided it was time to take another approach. On June 10, 1996, 
Eloise, along with the Native American Rights Fund, filed a lawsuit against the United States Department of the Interior, Cabell versus Norton. Their complaint did not demand money damages, even though they estimated that the United States owed the Native people billions of dollars. They just wanted an accounting of the funds. Where was the money? And what was it being used for? The lawsuit dragged on. The government lawyers tried to thwart the case at every turn. The legal battle spanned 15 years, four administrations, 10 legal appeals, 3,600 court filings, and the unprecedented action of a federal judge being removed from the case because he was seen by the government's lawyers as being too biased towards the plaintiffs. It finally ended in late 2010 when Congress passed legislation that was signed by President Barack Obama. A federal judge gave final approval on June 20th, 2011. The settlement was $3.4 billion for the management of funds, tribal land purchases, and higher education scholarship fund named for Eloise Cabell. The fight was over and Eloise Cabell had won. Eloise was a humble yet powerful woman who liked to joke about having made the quantum leap from being a dumb Indian to genius in one lifetime after she won a coveted MacArthur Foundation Genius Grant. Her life was a kaleidoscope of constant motion, and the famous legal victory was only one frame of that moving picture. Eloise dedicated her life to righting the injustice that she saw directed towards Native American people. After the final legislative bill was signed, Turk Cabell stated, finally, my mother, she is tremendously relentless when it comes to doing what she believes is right. Maybe now she can finally enjoy a normal life again and get something that she hasn't had for a long time, rest. Unfortunately, that was not to be for Eloise. She died of cancer on October 16, 2011, just six months after the signing ceremony for the bill. Although Eloise was unable to savor her accomplishments for long, she recognized the importance of her work. She said, first, they ignore you. Then, they laugh at you. Then, they fight you. Then, you win. <laughs> Words that brought her satisfaction to the end. <laughs> we now have time for questions. Um, if you can wait till I get to you, uh, with the microphone, and that way the folks at home can hear what's going on, otherwise they won't be able to hear your questions. So <laughs> just raise your hand and... Of course, Sydney has a question. Thank you. Thank you. This I'm looking so forward to your book. <laughs> I Thank only... You. Excuse me. I only want to say that what you talked about with Eloise, who was a board member for the Montana Community Foundation when I was the director, is only a tiny part of what she did, even though we find it so huge. <laughs> but when the Ford Foundation picked the Montana Community Foundation as one of three for a new rural initiative, we were able, as it take forever, but we chose in a competitive process the Blackfeet Reservation as one of the three beacon communities. And when we said beacon, we know we aren't on a 
river or a <laughs> sea. It was for those tiny beacons of light across the state that the early day av aviators used. We wanted these beacon communities to be that for the rest of the state. But what Eloise also did, first of all, the bank in Browning closed. Mm -hmm. Eloise knew if the bank was closed, everybody would have to go out of town, not only for banking, but for their shopping, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So, in fact, with one of our board members who helped create the legislation, she got the Blackfeet Bank started. Mm -hmm and a nonprofit arm of the bank. Right. And then she and Roberta Kipp, who's a teacher, said, well, our people aren't interested and they don't know about banking. What shall we do? <laughs> and Roberta said, well, Eloise, now you're a banker and I'm a teacher. You, let's figure it out. <laughs> they started a mini bank for the right. school children, I believe seventh and eighth grade. Yeah. One of whom gave a fabulous speech at a big dinner we had there. Oh. But even more important uh, in many ways, Eloise was back in Washington and it was a Senate hearing, I believe uh, Senator John McCain was the chair. Uh -huh. And it was about money for, and I don't remember if it was with the suit or not, uh -huh. but several people said, well, Indians don't know how to save money or how to use it or anything. And Eloise got up and told about the mini bank. Mm -hmm. They were also taught how to speak, speak in public. Right. Senator McCain invited her to bring them back to Washington to speak to the Senate. Uh -huh. At the same time, a couple of men from Wall Street came over and said, if you bring them back to Washington, if you'll bring them to New York, We'll take them around Wall Street and teach them a few things. <laughs> so with money from the Community Foundation, some other fundraising and so on, Eloise took these children back yeah. to Washington, D.C., where they performed admirably in the Senate hearing, and then they went to New York yes. and learned lots of other things. Yeah. But for me, the highlight, I know I'm wrapping it up. Um, <laughs> she's trying to grab the microphone. <laughs> the highlight of that trip in many ways for her and for me, mm -hmm. she took her students to the Lion King. Oh. I said, Eloise, you couldn't get tickets for that. Well, the costume designer was one of her fellow MacArthur Award oh. winners. That's right. And she said, I looked down that row of students <laughs> in this incredible performance. Mm -hmm. And she said, I just started to cry. Most of them hadn't been any further than Great Falls, Montana mm -hmm. in their lives. So Eloise touched many lives along with the suit. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for the story. Uh, it, I, I could have written a whole book just on Eloise because it's true. Um, every one of these women were just outstanding, but Eloise was, was a true, true beacon. She was. Everything she did, she, she just had this myopic view on improving the, the ways for the Native American, whether it was the young people, whether it was was the, the um, older generation. She was always there. Yeah. Any other questions? <laughs> I'm, I'm just wondering, in your book, you, you feature 12 women, and I'm wondering about the hard choices, and who are some of the people that had to be left out? Oh. <laughs> Oh, um, oh, I'm going to perch myself here. Um, it was a, a, a really difficult thing. And I'll give you a little bit of background on when, when I was approached 
it was really interesting because uh, I was at a, a American Indian Library Association meeting and was approached after that meeting by by this uh, editor uh, of the publisher who who published the book, and. Uh, when she, she talked about it, uh, she just kind of threw some ideas out. You know, what about strong Native American women? And, and uh, of course, I, I had had these ideas all my life, really. Like I said at the very beginning, growing up with very strong Native American women around me. Um, and so, but when it, when it was put to me, you know, who, who would you put in this book, I thought, you know, she said that the books are 10 chapters and, you know, they laid out all of how it was supposed to, how, how it was supposed to be. And I thought, oh my goodness, 10. And I, I mean, I knew there were lots of wonderful women in uh, Native women, but yeah, I just did not have, have a grasp. So I started doing, doing my research. And there, I've, Finally, I researched over 120 women. I had piles and piles, and thousands of pages <laughs> of, of, of uh, work. Who I left out, a number of artists, um, Wendy Redstar, uh, just some, some incredible women. Um, and that's why I'm kind of being bugged to do a volume two, which, <laughs> uh, but um, there, there are just so many. And when I started trying to uh, make some sense of how am I going to approach this, I, the first thing I did, I called my editor and said, you said 10 chapters. I can't do it for anything less than 12. <laughs> it's, I, give me 12. Well, I wanted 15, and we negotiated down to 12. And, uh, but it was, it was very interesting because all of a sudden, things kind of started coalescing for me. And I decided, first of all, I wanted to have a good geographic representation. Um, uh, and not just not just Native Americans, but I wanted Canadian, um, First Nations, Inuit, um, Mete, and because those, there are some incredibly strong women up there that that have led, you know, especially now the the boarding school issues and such. They're the ones that really kicked things off and really started demanding things of the of the government. So. I wanted to have geographics. I wanted to have a good representation of contemporary to historical. And then the other thing is I wanted to make sure that I had people in there. There's, uh, you know, there, there are so many wonderful women like Wilma Mankiller, a lot of them that, that we all know the names and we all know what they've done. But it's just amazing the the number of young women that are coming up that you didn't know their you don't know their names but they're doing wonderful things like Heather Don Thompson, like um, like uh, Emily Washings. These young women are 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 just uh, turning over the world in their in their ways and um, so. I, I wanted to make sure that those three things were covered. And as soon as I focused in on that, then I started pulling, pulling uh, the names together, the political, the education, the artists, and pulling from those different areas came up with who I came up with. Yeah. What a difficult task. <laughs> Any other questions? I, I'll, I'll tell you one, one story about, um, it was kind of funny because uh, when I started writing this book, it was in 2019 was when I was approached. And then I, uh, I really started you know, seriously getting getting into the book uh, towards the end, uh, December 
2019 and then moved into 2020. Um, finished up writing um, in, uh, in about July, I think, the yeah, first of July of 2020. And then it went off to the uh, publisher. It takes a long time to write a <laughs> to get a book published. And uh, but what was what was so remarkable was uh, uh, to me was uh, some of the people, well, all of the all of the women that I chose were truly amazing women. But we had the 2020 election, and the next thing I knew, I was getting this, this, uh, uh, all of this, this information about Deb Holland uh, being being considered for the Secretary of the Department of the Interior, and I, oh my gosh, wouldn't that be wonderful? And then it went a little further, and then it went a little further, and she was nominated. And then a little bit later, she was she was actually confirmed. And you know, who'd have thunk? You know, <laughs> I had I had uh, uh, selected her to, and mainly because she and Sharice Davids were the first Native American women to be elected into the House of Representatives, and that's. That's why she uh, and Sharice made it into the book. Well, it was kind of funny because my my manuscript had gone off in in uh, in well July of 20, 2020, and uh, and so it was supposed to be published. The book was supposed to be published in April, and all of a sudden. All of this started coming out about Deb Holland, and the next thing I knew, I was getting this this frantic email from my editor saying, "Can you write in another, just one paragraph, just one paragraph that she's been nominated?" I go, "Okay, well, when do you need it?" Uh, this was Wednesday, Friday at five at the latest. <laughs> okay, so so I got that done, got it shipped off to her, and then it was just a matter of weeks. I was getting this frantic phone call. <laughs> She's being confirmed. She's being, can you get that into the book? <laughs> sure, sure. And so, so uh, it, it, it was just like this, this moving behemoth for me. And uh, the, other, the other person that it, it was very interesting was the, um, Heather Dawn Thompson who very young, very incredible young woman. Um, she had done some, some really interesting work, um, very important work on the Pine Ridge Reservation dealing with sexual um, abuse and had, had, um, had uh, gone through the trials and everything with that. Um, and she was was recognized by the Biden administration, and she is now our executive director for tribal relations for the Department of the Ag of Agriculture, and so uh, it was really really fun to to see these women who, before you you really especially Heather Dawn, you know you had no idea that that. Uh, all of a sudden, they were going to become uh, right on the front page of the New York Times, and so it was it was a great thing. Yeah. Are there any other questions? <laughs> Thank you so much, Patricia. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you.